But now it's time for me to get out of promo mode and tell you about what's happening next. So we are going to be talking today all about virtual galas, the thing that I'm all excited and nervous about. Um, and so Sarah Hushley is going to be acting as our producer today. She's also brought in a guest, but I'm going to get out of the way and, uh, and give you some time with our experts. So here we go, screen sharing off, and uh, it's over to you, Sarah. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. And just give me one moment, please, while I do my screen share. We practice this very smoothly in our process in our practice. Let me make sure I can get it for you here. One second. How's that looking? Perfect. Great, thanks. I'm actually, uh, I have two screens going. So if you see me looking down, it's because I'm just keeping an eye on the chat. Um, so welcome everyone. Like Eli said, my name is Sarah Hushley. I am the founder of Charity Shift Consulting based in Vancouver. Um, I help small and mid-sized nonprofits raise more money. Um, specifically today, we're going to be talking about, as you know, virtual galas. Um, such an area of opportunity, especially right now during COVID. Um, a lot of opportunities for organizations to try out a virtual event, to do something new, um, but it is a bit of an unchartered territory. And so there's some nervousness and some uncertainty. So uh, we're hoping to be able to um, show you today the possibilities um, and uh, and show you that that there's a lot that can really be done. So um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce you to Ina Van Aken. Um, Ina is the executive director of One Girl Can. Um, the reason that I brought Ina here with me today, uh, obviously because she's a wonderful person, um, <laughs> but also because Ina was part of the one of the first um, galas that pivoted from a live in-person event to a virtual event. Um, and that happened uh, last spring. So I'll turn it over to Ina to say hello and to tell you a little bit about her organization. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Um, a little bit more about One Girl Can, um, just to give you a little bit of background. Um, so we are a Canadian uh, and Kenyan registered charity organization, and we work towards breaking the cycle of poverty and establishing gender equality. And we do that through um, education and mentorship for um, girls and young women in Kenya. Um, our organization is a little bit more unique uh, compared to some other organizations out there in that we are um, we use a very holistic approach. So we empower a girl from the minute she leaves primary school all the way up until she gains meaningful employment, which is um, somewhat different from uh, other organizations out there that work in this similar realm. Um, one thing to note, though, is that our program is or our programming is fully driven by our um, Kenyan office and our students. So um, the Canadian arm is really uh, responsible for fundraising, whereas the Kenyan office is very much um, working with the girls and our partner schools to make sure that uh, we are able to empower the girls on a day to day basis uh, as they should be empowered. Um, now, uh, as Sarah mentioned, we were one of the first ones out of the gate with our virtual event last year, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. Um, but one thing to note is that we are a very small organization, a very small nonprofit. However, our virtual event was incredibly successful. Um, a little bit of background on our event. Uh, we started our annual fundraiser uh, in 2015. And we had set out a goal of $35,000 and 75 people to attend. Now, over the years, um, that event grew quite quickly. And in 2019, we raised $550,000 with over 400 guests. So that's about a 390% increase. So we grew quickly um, and we had a lot of um, big boots to fill with our event last year. Uh, as Sarah said, as a result of COVID, we couldn't have our in-person event, which was scheduled for April 25th, um, and we had to pivot quickly. 
uh, which we will tell you more about uh, just in just a little bit. Great, thanks so much, Ina. Um, so just wanted to touch a little bit on what you'll learn today. So these are the three things that uh, you'll come away with after our time together. So how to prepare for your gala and making sure that you've got everything that you need to be well prepared. Um, how to ensure the maximum number of attendees and donors. And also how to create an effective, fun, and engaging event that your guests will love. Um, really, my goal today is to make you feel more confident um, in your understanding of virtual galas and what goes into them, and also excited and uh, confident in planning for an event if that's what you are uh, planning to do next. Um, I like to talk about, you know, people say the, the new normal, but I think really what we're talking about today and especially uh, at this point in 2021 is we're really talking about the next normal. Um, I think last year, you know, we saw organizations uh, with some nervousness about events. They might have just fully canceled events. Uh, some of them might have pivoted to a virtual and maybe had planned to come back to a regularly scheduled uh, in-person event for 2021. But when I talk to different organizations and donors and you know, surveys that we hear from across North America, it feels like in most places um, for 2021, events will be either virtual or a hybrid model where small groups might come together or there might be um, a, a portion of the event that is um, in person. But for the most part, it is going to be virtual. Um, I'd love it if you could, I know some people have already, which is fantastic, to pop it into the chat and let us know what your plans are, um, what you did last year. So last year, did you have an event planned um, and you just you know, decided to, to cancel it? Did you pivot it to a virtual event last year or are you planning a, a, a virtual event for this year? Would love to hear from you in the chat. Um, you know, I'd love to know what sort of decisions that you've made for your gala for this year. I know you've got just a couple months left. Um, what have you heard from your previous um, event attendees and, and how does that lead to what you're planning for for 2021? Yeah, so it's a, it's a very interesting question because, um, and I've, I've noticed in the chat too, some people are asking, what shall we do this year? Is it an in-person or a virtual? Um, we have had some um, conversations with some of our major donors in the last few months, and we've actually asked them for their feedback. As mm -hmm. in, uh, what, what did you like from last year? What are you looking forward to this year? What are some other organizations doing that you feel um, feel aligns with, with your goals? Mm -hmm. And a lot of our donors are saying that they actually prefer having a virtual event over an in-person event. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that was very, that was somewhat surprising. Um, a lot of people are saying that it, it, it took so much time of their, out of their day to actually go to an in-person event and they feel like they are much more dedicated with, with a virtual event. So what we're doing right now is a hybrid event, um, mm -hmm. depending on how COVID goes. Just to give you a little bit of detail, our next event is scheduled for June. Um, we are hoping that by June we'll be able to have some bubble parties. Again, we're yeah. planning for multiple scenarios here, so it all depends on what happens. Um, but what we've heard from the industry is that um, it, hybrid events are here to stay. Um, it's something that it seems to be well received. So I think moving forward, that's what we will be doing is a combination of both in person and as well as virtual, really. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and I want to just jump back into last year and I want to talk a little bit about your gala. I was so impressed, Ina, uh, when you and I first started talking and you were telling me uh, just how quickly you did from an in-person event that was essentially um, already planned, ready to go, uh, and then COVID hit and you needed to very quickly make a decision. So um, I'm just going to jump to the next slide. So this tells us a little bit about uh, your gala and when it was, but can you tell us what your process was when you walked through um, the realization that the, the gala that you had planned would have to be um, changed into something new? 
Yeah, for sure. So our event was planned for the end of April um, and then um, everything started shutting down here uh, in BC around mid-March. Um, mm. I think for the longest time we were still somewhat in denial. Uh, we still figured, oh, it's going to take a couple of weeks and we'll, we'll be moving forward with everything. Um, everything was in place. We had started ticket sales. We had um, started advertising towards uh, our, our uh, stakeholders. We had done sponsorship agreements. Like literally everything was ready. We were working on our presentations, our slideshows. Uh, the script was good to go. And so when that happened, we one thing to realize is for us, um, our annual fundraiser was our biggest uh, revenue generating opportunity. So right. the the lives of the girls that we support were were basically on the line. So we we felt like we had an obligation um, towards the girls to make sure that we somehow managed to pivot quickly. Um, we are a very small team. We have a team of four people um, and we just, we realized there was no way around it. So what we did is we looked at our structure and we looked at what our in-person event was set up as and how mm -hmm. much of that we could transfer into a virtual environment. And so when we were going in through that process, what we looked at was, okay, what are the key elements that we need to keep? And what are some of the things that don't transfer well to virtual? And in that decision, we decided to not do our live auction. Um, I know mm -hmm. nowadays live auctions are becoming a bit more common on virtual. Back then, our live auction was focused around experiences. And yes. actually, there was just no way around that. We couldn't do that. But everything else was still very much in place. And what we really looked at is finding the right production company that was key um one of the things to note with our event is that we have a very low cost event that's something we've always prided ourselves on is that we don't do elaborate dinners or anything like that um, we keep it to the bare basics or the bare minimum and so the actual virtual event allowed us to work on that even more right yeah that's a really good point i mean that's something that and um, with all of the events that uh, that I partner with with other charities is that they're finding that their expenses have been reduced. We're no longer paying for um, hotels and catering and wine and decor. Um, and instead, we're able just to focus on the that matter in providing uh, a, a well thought out and well planned event. And I think also um, because we are opening it up to a wider audience, anybody can join from literally any, anywhere in the world. Um, our audience is bigger and our potential for revenue is bigger. So um, I'm really glad you mentioned that. We'll jump into that in a bit more detail in just a second. But um, I think it's really exciting to share what your results were, Ina. Um, we've got that on the next slide here. So do you want to kind of talk us through what your results looked like from last year's gala? Yeah, for sure. So we brought in three hundred and twenty thousand um, dollars. We yeah. had five hundred and eighty-two registrants, which was much more than we had in previous years. Um, our goal was to get to five hundred and fifty in with an in-person event. So to be able to reach that with the short turnaround um, to advertise was quite significant. We noticed that our audience was coming from um, not just all over Canada, but the U.S. Mm -hmm. and even Europe, which was which was a very big aha moment for us. Yeah. And then, um, in terms of our expenses, we spent thirteen thousand five hundred dollars. Wow! And I have to say, with that number, the majority of that actually went to our event management company that we worked with um, because. Mm -hmm when we had already paid a significant amount of money towards well significant in the big scheme of things not that significant but we had we had paid a lot of um event management and event planning costs already um, right. the in person event so truly our production cost for switching to a virtual um a virtual event was about 5 6000 mm dollars -hmm. um and so that's that's all we we looked at so that was the the biggest um the biggest expense really uh but we had a fantastic turnaround um mind you i i do want to say one thing though is that uh, what we did last year i don't think we could get away with 
uh, anymore this year. I think you would want to spend a little bit more on production. The reality is that I, from my perspective, we we were at the beginning, and so people were very forgiving with the quality of of the production. Um, yes, it was still it was good. It was it worked well, but from behind the scenes, from our perspective, we know we could do better, and so we are budgeting for a little bit more when it comes to our production uh, for this year's event. But it, it this goes to show you that uh, you can reach a really large audience, and you can still bring in a significant amount. This was at the height of the pandemic too. We didn't know whether we were going to get anything because. People, people were in a tough spot and still are. So um, yeah, we were quite. We we consider this to be quite successful. Yes, absolutely. And Ina, just thinking about your registry, how how does that compare um, to the number of people who actually attended your in person event in 2019? Do you, do you have those numbers or? Yeah, so we um, we had about 400 people attend our in-person event. Um, so it, it's higher. What we are hoping for this year is around the same number, around 500-ish people, um, mm -hmm. because it's a bit of a different setup. Uh, we also know that a lot of people are are having having done many events, so we're trying to inc incorporate that. Um, we are still focusing on the majority of our audience to be within BC, but we are definitely expanding across Canada and, and targeting across Canada audience. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm so excited to follow along your story and see how your 2021 gala turns out, because after the success of, of last year, I'm sure it will only kind of go up from there. I hope um, so. It's going to be yeah. completely different from before, and, and we know that it needs to be a little bit different, but we can get into that in a little bit, too. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on, how many people have heard that this makes me laugh a little bit because, you know, I hear from a lot of my partners and they say, oh, like, isn't everyone Zoomed out? And, you know, people don't want to attend just another online virtual thing. And it's so funny. I was having that conversation with someone um, in the event uh, planning industry who I respect quite a bit. And she laughed as well. And she said, you know, what's funny. People talk about Zoom fatigue, but they don't talk about Netflix fatigue. And, and to me, that that really kind of got me thinking about why is it that we don't get tired of watching Netflix? And it's because when we watch Netflix, it's being, it's, it's interesting content. It's messaging that's been uh, curated and created just for us. Um, Netflix knows what we want to see. It cuts out everything that, that we don't, you know, need to see. And because of that, we're engaged and we're part of the, and we kind of lose ourselves in the story. I mean, who's guilty of losing a couple hours watching Netflix and you don't even realize how much time has passed by. Um, but I think it's important to put that in context is that, yeah, nobody wants to sit through another boring Zoom meeting, but that's not what a virtual gala is and that's not what it should be. Um, and, and I think kind of touching on Ina's piece about what to um, invest in, I think maybe a year ago or almost a year ago when, when COVID first hit and we were all moving things to virtual, I think people were kind of forgiving of, you know, tech issues and stumbles here and there. But I think a year in, people have really high expectations um, of, you know, good sound quality, good entertainment value. Um, and, and I would say when you are in your event, um, certainly that's one of the most important things to to consider and also to invest in is to make sure that your uh, production quality and your production value is really high so that people um, don't have those stumbling blocks of difficulties with seeing or hearing or really understanding what your message is. Um, I think it's also important too to think about um, who your audience is, you know, um, I did an event a little while ago, and we knew that our audience was going to be a little bit older. Um, and we literally started the event with, uh, it was hosted on zoom. And I did a screenshot of, you know, the bottom um, menu on zoom where it 
where you and said, you know, click this button, uh, hover your mouse over this button and click it. That's how you mute yourself. And, you know, go to this button and click this button to pin the speaker view and and really helping people feel um, not feel embarrassed that they don't know that, but making sure that everybody's on the same page with that knowledge. Because um, then not only are they engaged in what you're doing, but they also feel included. Um, Another event uh, that happened locally a few weeks ago, uh, what they did about three hours before they, their event, um, they sent out sort of like a tech how-to, and I thought it was really, really clever. Uh, one of the things that was talked about how to connect your laptop to your TV. Um, for those of us that know how to do that, that would be second nature, but for somebody who doesn't know how to do that, this was very easy steps, you know, set up your laptop, find your HDMI cable, here's a little image, this is what the cable looks like, and connect it. And it was done a few hours in advance so that if somebody wasn't familiar with doing something like that, they might be able to you know, do a bit more research and figure it out. So um, these are the kinds of things to think about. It's different than when you're in person and you can just you know, bring somebody in the door and show them, you know, here's the silent auction section and here's the, the ballroom and here's your table. This is something that people sort of have to be able to sort out for themselves. And you wanna make sure that they're able to do that in a really um, easy way. Um, Ina, I'm so curious to know what you're doing with your event to make sure that people are engaged and included and also that it's not boring. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we, um, last year it was a very much um, a, a one-way street. It was a, a, it wasn't, it was a broadcast basically. There wasn't mm -hmm. much interactivity. This year uh, we are changing it up because that was feedback that we received from both our sponsors as well as donors was that they are looking for interactivity and they don't just want to sit and stare at a stream and, and listen in. They actually want to play and become a part of that. And yeah. so um, we're having a pre-event that, first of all, allows that interactivity. Uh, we might do like a mixologist or something along those lines. But it also allows people to sign up ahead of time and actually test their connection and make sure that everything runs smoothly. Um, we will have tech support um, on site the entire time, as well as if we go to the point of having some bubble parties, we will have tech support uh, with with our uh, with our bigger bubble parties as well. Um, we are having uh, somewhat a, a unique event with a virtual reality experience. Um, so, wow. yeah, we're transition. We're basically traveling to Kenya, and um, our audience will be able to walk around with the girls and use their phones to be able to do that. Uh, they'll visit the the families' houses. They'll walk to school with the girls. So. It's a bit more technologically advanced in a way. So we know we have to have that tech support ready. But we also know that our storytelling is going to be quite unique and quite different, which we know will resonate with our audience. Um, so we, we really make sure that as part of our platform choice, there is also that opportunity to be interactive. And that's something that we went back and forth about quite frequently about, okay, is it is it relevant to have this more expensive platform that allows us to have that connection so that mm -hmm. our audience communicate with each other and still feel like they're somewhat networking. Um, and so that's that's really what we're what we're looking at right now. Um, we're making sure that uh, people have the ability to communicate with each other as well as with us. And, and feel part of the show and not just sitting in a room and, and staring at a, at a computer screen or a TV screen. Absolutely. I love that idea that you're actually literally bringing people into your story. Um, that To me, that's kind of that next level of beyond the storytelling, beyond sharing an impactful story. You're, you're in a way, such a, that's fantastic. I'm excited to see that all kind of come together. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about um, is audience, and we've kind of touched on audience a little bit, but um, I think it, it is the most important thing to consider. When I work with charity partners, they'll say to me, you know, how how long should we do the event? What platform should we use? What's the what's the best 
you know, way to do this. And what it really comes down to is your audience. There's, there's no exact answer for every um, event because every event is, is slightly different. Um, and I've chosen the photos um, on this slide because I want to really show that, you know, someone could be sitting at home with their laptop watching your event. Uh, they could have young kids and they're all, you know, sitting in their living room watching the event. Um, or it could be, you know, depending on restrictions and what those might look like in the coming year in different areas, it might be a bubble party that people can have in their backyard. So it looks almost like it would have been before COVID. Um, but I think it's super important when you're building your program, when you're building your speeches, um, when you're doing your pre-recorded show, that you really want to make sure that everything is tailored to your audience. Um, I did an event a little while ago that was really, I would say the average person um, in our audience was probably 65 plus. And the way that we spoke to that audience, the way that the program was built was designed very, very differently um, than an event that I did that was geared to kind of a 20 and 30 year old type of audience. Um, the other thing that I think is really exciting about virtual events is it completely democratizes um, this idea, especially around galas. You know, when we think of galas, the very expensive, high ticket, uh, you know, social event in the city, um, there's so many people for so many different reasons that they're not able to, to go to something like that. Um, with virtual events, what we're seeing is that people are no longer bound by physical barriers, uh, by financial constraints, by health constraints. Um, I did one for uh, a health charity, Cystic Fibrosis, actually. We've got a couple people from Cystic Fibrosis Canada uh, on the call today. And with our virtual events, we actually had people who live with cystic fibrosis um, whose health prevented them from attending our events in the past. Um, and they were able to join the, for the very first time virtually. Um, and that's really exciting, I think, to, to truly be inclusive um, and to truly break down these barriers and, and allow people to, uh, to join regardless of, of where they are. Um, I think it's also important to, um, again, think about how are these people feeling in a virtual setting? Are they, you know, people who work from home and they're on video calls all day, every day? Um, or might this be the first time that they're attending uh, uh, an event like this. And so, so how comfortable are they? How familiar are they with what they're doing? Um, and I think Ina said as well, thinking about your audience, don't only think about who's attended in the past, think about who also could potentially attend now and in the future. Um, and what their expe expectations might look like um, and how you can make it uh, engaging and exciting for them. Um, Ina, how are you planning this with your audience, with your with your event for um, this year? It, we, we've gone back and forth with different options, um, but uh, again, speaking to our donors, we, we really try to get their input on on some of these topics to see okay what can we do with with our new event and so um one of the things that came up was that accessibility a, a lot of our our donors feel that we are quite well known to have like anyone can go to our event it's targeted to anyone even in person that was the case um so what we're doing this year is um we're we're basing it we have we have such a diverse audience of different uh, stages in their life so what we're doing is we're actually working with um different tiered ticket options so whereas we used to have our early bird ticket and then you just paid full price for the ticket and you came we're now looking at making it even more accessible so we have a low cost ticket just for the broadcasting link um we'll have a second tier ticket which is probably going to be around 125 dollars and that includes a gift basket mm -hmm. for one of our sponsors so our the, the people who purchase that ticket will get a return of 99 dollars worth of product uh for a ticket of 125 dollars okay. and then we have a set a third tier where we can offer something like whether it's wine or charcuterie or maybe a more carefully curated box based on on the audience that you have that uh that would appeal to we 
played with the idea of having more elaborate bespoke bubble parties almost. Um, but we actually mm -hmm. walked away from that because we feel that a lot of our donors, um, if, if they are going to buy a package of maybe even a thousand dollars or more, that might take away from their actual giving capacity at the event. So what we decided right. is we'll work with our event planner. If a donor comes up to us and they say, oh, you know what? The time is ripe. COVID is un somewhat under control. We can have a more uh, elaborate party that will work with your mm -hmm. event planner and there's a menu of choices that they can pick and choose from to see if they want their um their party catered or not or if they want decorations or uh anything anything like audiovisual um anything related to that so we leave that up until up to the donor to decide um it's available we offer the service but then it doesn't take away from our logistics knowing that we are a fairly small team and we can't be possibly planning this for uh, all all the all the donors that we're working with. Um, so yeah, it's it's a different approach, but it feels like there's something for everyone. And um, even if you don't want to don't want to spend too much, you can you can look at that. Um, something else we've seen out there that seems to be doing quite well is also offering the opportunity to give by donation. So you set the minimum standard for your ticketing. And then you allow people to give more if they want to give more. So just a different way of looking at things and making it more accessible. That's interesting. I love the idea that you're making it low cost for people who don't want to spend the extra money on a ticket, but that you're also kind of outsourcing uh, your event planning so that you're taking the logistics off of your small team, but still allowing people to have those kind of extravagant yeah. Um, parties and celebrations, if that's what they choose to do. I, I think I think that's really smart um, because then you're still allowing the people who used to attend a very, you know, luxurious or exciting uh, gala can still have an element of that in a way that's that's safe and, and kind of appropriate for what you're doing. So I think that's really smart. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot when we talk about making sure that we're, you know, raising as much money as possible with our virtual galas is sponsorship. And of course, sponsorship being such a big part of revenue, but also a big part of what our events are. Um, and I think personally, I think that the opportunities for sponsorship in virtual events are actually larger than opportunities for um, sponsorship in live events. And I'll tell you why. For sponsors, we, in the nonprofit space, we seem, we sometimes think of sponsorship as the same as a donation, and it's really not. A, a sponsorship, a company is trying to um, market their brand and position their brand in a particular way. And if you think about it, for a sponsor at a live event, their only their sponsorship is only being seen by the people physically in that space. When we talk about it from a virtual perspective, and and I think Ina's example was great about the number of of people um, included in a virtual event as opposed to a live event. That sponsorship opportunity in a virtual space becomes huge. Um, the opportunities are endless for the ways that a sponsor could um, partner with your organization in a way that makes sense for them. So it's no longer going to be, you know, Coat Check is sponsored by this law firm or, uh, you know, a big sign when you walk into a ballroom that this gala is presented by so and so. Um, but there are ways, whether that be, um, you know, I've seen a gala where we had a sponsor who sponsored a virtual wine tasting. Um, I saw another event where there was a virtual uh, cheese tasting that was done. Um, and these are sponsored by different companies. And it actually makes the sponsorship um, quite a bit stronger, um, I think, because the there's there's a bit more of a tie in rather than just a sponsor logo kind of showing up here and there. Um, you know, I'm curious to know what you're doing with your sponsorship um, opportunities for your next gala. Um, so we have taken a bit of a different approach. Um, we used to go out with our sponsorship package with all the different sponsorship available. Mm -hmm. And then it was like a pick and choose menu almost for our sponsors. 
Um, so what we've done this year is we've actually created a different package. We've created an outline of our event and we have mm -hmm. taken that to our existing sponsors as well as new sponsors. And um, we've, we've gauged their interest in the event, first of all. First of all. Um, and then the second part to that is that based on the conversation we're having with them, we actually create a, a specific customized sponsorship package for them. Mostly because sponsors kept telling us that uh, I don't just want my logo on a slideshow. I, mm -hmm. I want lead generation. And so yes. some sponsors are very much about the logos and the visibility, but there are a lot of other sponsors out there that are more specific and they want lead generation. And even though it may seem more difficult in a virtual setting, um, there are platforms out there that allow you to create a sponsorship room and they can bring all their leads in. And so what we're doing is we're actually tying our sponsorship to our storytelling. So when our audience is getting a message, um, we're sending out push notifications as they transition to um, a different segment of the story as we're sharing stories. Okay. And so um, one of them could be, for example, the story of this person is brought to you by this sponsor. And so it's, it's, more, it's more holistic. It's, it feels more natural and organic rather than just a name, on a, a name on a slide. And we're sharing the sponsor's stories in terms of how they became involved with us and making that oh. a part of our actual event rather than just, again, just that logo. And there are sponsors that want just that logo, but for us mm -hmm. personally, we've noticed that that's the request that we're getting is they want something more and they want that engagement piece. And that goes back to your platform choices. Make sure that you find something that, that works with your sponsorship needs and have those conversations as you build out your, your structure for the night or for the, for the event. So don't, don't go out and, and lock everything in, but try to find out what your key stakeholders need from you before you determine which platforms you're going to go with. Right, right. Absolutely. And just kind of touching on that point, I wanted to jump into um, moments of impact. And I think when we talk about audience, when we talk about engaging people and truly raising as much money as possible, um, I think it's those moments of impact where we're bringing people into our stories and getting them um, to feel whatever it is that we want them to feel. Um, so our stories, our videos, uh, site tour, you know, you gave that great example of with your storytelling, how you're actually bringing people um, into your organization um, and thinking about what the journey that you want your audience to go on. So, you know, in a live event, it might have been, uh, you know, if you're at a hospital foundation, for example, it might have been um, a patient who is treated at your hospital um, and they, they tell their story about the impact. Um, in, in a similar way, we would have something like that where everything really leads up to the big ask moment. So that's, you know, what we would call a fund a need um, where we're asking people to to make a donation for whatever the the cause is um, that we're talking about um best practice from what we've seen is that an event should typically be about 60 minutes um, usually any longer than 60 minutes is when you really start to lose your audience um, and the most important content so your really key moments um, your big ask in, in the first 35 to 40 minutes, because that's about the time that we start to lose people's attention. Um, you also want to consider what's pre-recorded. So definitely if you've got uh, videos or speeches, uh, anything like that, that you've got, you know, people speaking, you want to make sure that you can have it pre-recorded so that you can edit and you can also control the time of it as well. Um, you want to consider live and remote people just like me who are, you know, coming to you live, but from their home office. Um, and then also live and in studio, if you choose to do um, a portion of your event, of your event, maybe your, your MCs and your auctioneer, for example, are, are in studio and they're live. Um, and the most important thing when we're talking about impact is to remember that every minute 
counts. So not only do you want to make sure that your tech and your production is removing any hiccups, any, uh, you know, awkward screen issues or any sort of delays or, or time um, that's wasted, but you also want to make sure uh, that every word that's spoken um, is also impactful. So what I like to do when I'm working with my charity partners is I'll go through their script. Um, and if there's anything that's repeated, I just cross it out or suggest that it be, you know, communicated in a different way. Um, I think we've all gone to those events where, you know, we hear 10 different people thanking the volunteers and sponsors. And while that's nice, by the time you've heard it the second time, you kind of, yeah, everybody gets it. <laughs> so it's just making sure that all of that content um, is really aligned. The other thing um, when you're talking about the tech and the production pieces as well is uh, rather than speaking some of those words, you could also, you know, potentially have it running across the bottom of the screen. So instead of, uh, you know, maybe your, I don't know, one of your your smaller dollar or smaller um, sponsors, rather than taking the time to, to, to say their name and recognize them, maybe you just have it running across the bottom of the screen along with some other um, information. Um, so those are kinds of the things to keep in mind when you are making your, um, when you're planning your event is really having those moments of impact and making sure that it's exciting and interesting the whole way through. Um, Ina, just curious to know what you've done with your moments of impact. I know you've touched on a few things so far, but did you have anything else that you wanted to add in this area? Yeah, so we limit, um, our programming is limited to just one keynote speaker mm. and our impact stories. Um, we typically have one impact story, but in this case, considering that we're taking our, our audience on a journey, we have about six um, little stories. Um, and that's going to be spread throughout the event. But much to your point, um, we we do the most important fundraising in the first half an hour to 40 mm -hmm. minutes. Um, and that's we, we start with those stories with that that really eye opening moment of this is why we're doing what we're doing. And then we yeah. head straight into the fundraising. And so there there is nothing in between. We don't do um, speeches. It, it's it's very short and brief. And we typically stick to 60 minutes as well, which has been very oh, successful. Perfect. perfect. That's great. Um, I just wanted to touch on this, uh, keep, keeping an eye on the time. We've got about seven minutes left together. So I'm just going to maybe just kind of rush through this a little bit, but happy to chat with people afterwards. Um, planning for success. When I work with my charity partners, um, I put together a fairly detailed plan so that we know what happen and when. So similar to your in-person events, there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of moving pieces, a lot of different things that need to happen. But I think it's important. Uh, I won't go through everything here just in the interest of time. But one of the things that I really do want to um, point out here that I think is super important, um, number one is three to six months prior is to confirm your fundraising channels. So if you, you are if you have a website where people are, are donating online, if you've got a silent auction on that website, um, if you have sponsors who might be paying by check or credit card, um, if you you may want to set up text messaging for um, for donations. So confirming all of those fundraising channels well in advance is really going to help you um, make sure that you've got all the details that you need. That does take some time to set up. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to note from this plan is tech and dress rehearsals. In a in a live event, you know, you might have the MC go up and do a mic check, and you know, the AV team and and the event manager is testing sound and lighting, uh, and it's fairly easy and quick to do. But in a virtual space. Um, I hope we've highlighted to you during today's session how important it is to have your production and your tech working perfectly and your tech and your dress rehearsal is ideal to have one to three weeks in advance um, and then closer to the to the event. So if you could do it one to three weeks in advance and then maybe the day before the event or event day. And I will say for two of the events that I've done, the tech rehearsal actually revealed some issues that we would not have been aware of um, 
had we not done that tech and dress rehearsal. So there was a couple things that we dramatically changed that made all of the difference um, in the success of our event. So I would certainly recommend that you do that uh, at least one to three weeks in advance because that gives you time to actually change things. If you're doing your tech or your dress rehearsal, your first one happens the day before, it might actually be too late um, to make any final changes. Um, and then post event, I think is also really important that you wanna thank everybody. You wanna report on the numbers um, so far, send them the recording of the event for those that weren't able to join and also remind people that donations are still being accepted. So what I like to do with fundraising events is at the end we announce the total amount raised so far, but we let people know it's just so far and that we'll come back to them with a final total, whatever the, the end date, the decided end date happens to be. Um, and then finally, just on maximizing fundraising, um, these are just some additional items that I wanted to highlight here. There's so many places we can take this, but I think that these are some, some important things to get you thinking. So making sure you have donors giving at each level that you're gonna be asking for, uh, looking into potentially having matching donors, um, again, multiple ways to give, um, consider how your ticket costs might impact your fundraising. Um, when you're doing your asks, having impact statements. So your $100 donation helps us, blah, blah, blah. Um, make sure your MC is well informed of who your top donors are. Um, and recognize your donors. So whenever a donation comes in, you want to make sure that you've got something planned so that your MC says, wow, I just got a $1,000 donation in from Ina. Ina, thank you so much. Um, and then, you know, a couple minutes later, wow, Eli just sent in $1,000. Thank you so much, Eli. People love to hear what other people are doing. And of course, we all love to hear our names. Um, and so making sure that people are recognized in that moment as best as you possibly can um, is, is really great. Uh, and will really help kind of feed that excitement and get people really um, engaged and excited about the fundraising that you're doing. So that kind of is the final part of our presentation. We've got about two minutes to go. And I know that Eli has been super busy in the chat. So thank you so much for that. Um, but we've got just a couple of minutes if there's any questions that we can answer uh, right away. If there's anything that's come up. I don't know, Eli, if you had one that you wanted to... Yeah, there's a couple of questions that have been showing up and I've been putting them into the Q&A. Um, but let's start here with a question from Cindy. You know, people are always excited about the tools questions, which is what online platform is uh, One Girl Can using for the 2021 event? So right now, we're still in the process of making that final decision. Um, we're working with um, two producers or production companies. One is um, Peak Performance and the other one is um, Pro Show. Now, the decision will be driven by our sponsor needs mostly um, because we, we know that the platforms that we've selected, the audience needs are taken care of. It's mostly driven by sponsors. So we're finalizing our conversations with our sponsors to really determine, okay, what is it that they need? And that's going to ultimately decide which platform we choose. So if anyone does want to know uh, more about that, I did share my email in the um, in the chat. Feel free to reach out to me because uh, I can I can share the details and the research that we've done so far um, if, if that's of any interest. Perfect. So we have time for two lightning questions. We're looking at like, you know, the three sentence answers. So question one, you said that there are characteristics of a good events partner that you should be looking for. What are those? What do you need in a partner to make this work? Sorry, was that about sponsors? Uh, sorry, this was about finding like sort of the event planning consultant. Oh, yeah, great question. Um, I think it really depends on what your ability is within your team. Some of the teams that I work with, um, you know, they might not have anyone on staff who does event planning and I can come in and help them um, with that. And sometimes uh, it's really just kind of taking the lead on the virtual pieces. So in some some cases, the charity might, you know, do the the program and and put together all of the elements of it. And then um, as an event planner, I would just come in and, and help them really with the kind of behind the scenes tech um, portion of it and make sure that the donor experience 
um, is exciting and engaging for everyone. Cool. One more question, which is how are char charity online auctions going to work without the powerful lubricant of liquor and peer pressure? <laughs> That's a great question. So what's worked really well is um, having that engaging auctioneer and MC. I'd be happy to share um, a recording of an event that I did where we had Fred Lee. For those of you that are familiar with Fred Lee, he gets so excited um, that people get really, really excited uh, about making their donations. And we also had volunteers at the production studio as donations were coming through on the website, through text messages, through our WhatsApp channel, people were quickly running up names to him and he was legitimately getting really excited about hearing people uh, people's names come in. Um, and also in that event, we had a matching donor uh, that was secured in advance that we announced partway through the, um, the auction ask. So people knew I better give in the next, you know, 10 minutes because these donations are going to be matched. Lovely. Well, thank you so much. As you said, with your best practice, one hour in, people are starting to drift off as, as happens. I've learned that same thing myself. So let me then take for the screen share and just do a final closure to talk about what's coming next. Um, but, uh, but here we go. Kapow, kapow. So of course, first of all, thank you. It is such a gift to have the two of you donating your time and expertise and then offering to keep sharing what you've learned with the rest of the community. So super grateful for that. We will of course wrap up the video and share that by the end of the week as well. But we're not Hi. done yet. We are gonna be back on April 13th. Um, and this is gonna be a really interesting event where we're gonna actually do a, a really a visual interactive event around graphic recording and how it can be used for building equity and community in a virtual age. So I'm really excited about that event too. I think it's gonna work out really well with their screen sharing setup. Um, and we encourage you to register for that April 13th event. Um, otherwise, as I said, we need your help. We're a scrappy group of volunteers and it doesn't happen by accident. It happens because people keep on putting their hands up and saying, I wanna get involved. So. If you got a great event idea, bring it to me. I'm happy to support you in making that happen in the world. Or maybe you want to be the person monitoring the chat. Again, happy to work with you on setting up for that. Um, so reach out, drop your you know a note to me by email or right there in the chat, and uh, and we'll find a way to bring you into this community. And with that, let's wrap it up. Again, super grateful to our experts for you know being convinced to. To get involved with this and uh and we'll keep doing these great things again don't be strangers i'll see you all bye thank you bye